Hi, everyone. Um, we're going to take a little trip into uh, sort of uh, thinking about uh, how Rhino stacks up to other 3D modelers. And we're also going to consider how Rhino uh, works as on a kind of technical level. So let me advance the slide. So there's uh, four main classes of 3D modeling technologies. And as we're looking at um, Rhino in particular, but other software packages as well, I think it's important to just know kind of what's out there and what your options are as you move on further within the field. Um, so a lot of people ask me why I choose to work with Rhino. And there's a couple of reasons. Um, I think it actually is a really one of the kind of standout uh, programs for art and design, which um, the last time I checked is what we're doing. Uh, the um, the other reason is that um, it's a pretty low cost um, software uh, relative to other 3D modeling packages. Um, there are some 3D modelers that are available for free, um, and I think they're great. But uh, ultimately, I think you cannot really do as many of the um, awesome things that you can do in Rhino. So um, I think they might be more appropriate um, kind of at the high school level. Um, so, uh, but, uh, you know, if I were in a pinch and I needed something to uh, do my work uh, in and I didn't have a license, I would certainly consider using um, some of Autodesk's uh, free options. Um, I think that uh, the courses in the digital media course sequence here in the art department are also uh, primarily using Rhino. So um, by learning a little bit about it now, you're set, kind of setting yourself up for success if you wanted to take the digital media animation sequence. Um, so uh, also, I feel like a lot of these um, techniques and technolo technologies are highly transferable, meaning that once you learn kind of how to use a control point curve, um, you can pretty much use a control point curve in any software. Um, and so I think that um, Rhino kind of covers most of the main bases that I think are important to know. Um, if Even if you're going to use another modeler, you could probably pick it up very quickly. So. Um, Rhino uses a technology primarily uh, called NURBS, and NURBS um, kind of, you know, if we're going to translate that acronym, it's uh, non-uniform rational beast lines. And what that means is, um, we'll look at that in more detail, but it's basically a way of mathematically representing freeform curves. Um, and so uh, what you see or what you may have already seen in the first video is that when you uh, when Rhino makes those surfaces, they're extremely smooth um, and they're extremely precise. There's another class of modeling, which um, used to be kind of primarily used for uh, cinematic special effects and gaming, um, and that would be polygonal modeling. Um, so polygonal modeling certainly has its place, um, and it's got a really uh, long history. I think that one thing to keep in mind with polygonal modeling is that you can always convert from NURBS to polygons, but you can't convert from polygons to NURBS. So it's a one-way street. And um, my feeling would be um, to, you know, use the NURBS modeler and just convert to polygons at the end um, because you're not getting any real special benefit um, by kind of working natively in polygons. Um, I think there are reasons why people need polygon models. So if you're working with any kind of real-time rendering engine or, you know, like a game system, you certainly have to really use poly uh, polygon-based models. Um, but as I said, you can generate those easily um, in Rhino. So we'll do a little bit of that today, kind of going back and forth. Um, and then there's a really kind of exotic uh, models, modeling style called surface subdivision modeling. It's really cool. You can generate like, um, you know, things that look like biological objects or um, stuff like that. Um, and But it's very exotic and almost nobody does it. <laughs> So uh, then the last category is constructive solid geometry, and that is uh, a style of modeling where uh, solid 3D forms are added and subtracted to each other. And so that's really the core functionality of, 
com- core functionality of the uh, AutoCAD suite. Um, and there's a, an open source uh, code-based tool called OpenSCAD uh, if you're interested in that sort of modeling and you really like to code, um, you may like OpenSCAD. Um, this functionality is supported in most modern modelers um, to some degree through uh, what's called Boolean operations. Um, and Boolean is really just a fancy word for logical. Um, so uh, we could think of things like, um, you know, so uh, if you subtracted like this uh, pen from this glass, what kind of a shape would that leave? So those are the kinds of things that happen in that in that type of a model. Now, I think it's important, especially if you're looking at uh, software, you know, like Rhino and other other than Rhino, um, that many soft, contemporary software packages have more than one of these uh, classes of functionality. So, for example, Rhino uh, definitely is like based on NURBS. You can do polygonal modeling. I wouldn't say it's the best at it, but you can do it. Um, surface subdivision modeling, I know you can do with the plugin, and uh, it also supports constructive solid geometry. So likewise, some of Autodesk's new products, um, I use Fusion 360 a lot for um, when I work with uh, my digital fabrication tools. And um, something like Fusion 360 can support um, constructive solid geometry. That's its native format. Um, it can also do nerves and it can also do uh, polygons. So it's really common for most software programs to have more than one of these um, types of functionality. Um, but historically, they all kind of came out of focusing on just one. And so there's usually one that they might be best at. And so in the case of Rhino, that thing is definitely nerves. So I know we built a, a control point curve in our last video. And you may notice that this um, control point curve um, is behaving in a very similar way. Um, so one of the things that you get with control point curve is you get a, a curve that can be manipulated over and over and over again. Um, so that flexibility is one of the really good things uh, about control point curves. Whereas if you were to draw a, um, something with the paintbrush, let's say, in Photoshop, um, you kind of put it down and then you're done. Um, but with the uh, curve points, um, you can kind of edit it infinitely. Um, so there are two kind of main factors for editing curves. There's the number of control points, and then there's also the degree of the curve. We're not going to get too into the degree of the curve, but the degree of the curve does actually dictate how tightly uh, the curve sticks to the points. Um, so if you are interested in playing with that, go for it. Um, so here's an example of a single surface. And in addition to curve edit points in Rhino, you can also use surface edit points. Um, and those can be kind of super fun. Um, we probably will have a chance to do it in our, in our uh, lessons during this class. So let's jump into Rhino for just a few minutes. And I want to address kind of the idea of NURBS versus polygons. So I start off with, um, I'm starting off with a new um, sort of grid here. Um, I could certainly go to settings and make sure my grid is set up uh, as I did in the previous video, but um, my grid is set up the way I want it. So I'm going to just move on from here. Okay, so um, to kind of illustrate some of those examples uh, or some of those ideas from the lecture, I'm going to go ahead and just um, make a simple shape through uh, the method that we used uh, last time, which is making a control point curve. And uh, I'm just going to revolve it to kind of make like a bottle shape. Um, and I just want to say uh, for this, because I'm kind of going for a, a curved I'm going to go ahead and get rid of the ortho so I can kind of move around wherever I want. Um, and I'm just going to make like a like a sort of mm, 
narrow bottle with a flared thing there. Okay, so now I'm gonna go ahead and revolve this. And uh, when I revolve it, I think I'm gonna um, go ahead and just cap the, the top and the bottom um, because I'm really just looking for kind of a curvaceous object to illustrate um, this idea of polygons versus nerves. Um, and kind of what the visual difference is going to be. Um, and what we're also going to talk about uh, two different types of kind of polygon models that you really should know about. Um, one is a, what's considered a high resolution polygon model, uh, and the other is considered a low resolution polygon model. And so um, those would be used for just different applications. So I'm going to get in here and go ahead and just revolve this. Um, I'm going to make a use of just a straight axis and make it a very kind of straightforward uh, thing here. So um, now what I'm going to do with this object is I'm going to take the actual revolved surface. I'm going to go ahead and go to the solid menu and select cap planar holes. Um, just so it's solid, um, I'm going to pretend that I'm 3D printing this for some reason. Uh, and I'm going to uh, move myself real briefly. And maybe I can park it up here. I took myself out of the last video because I couldn't figure out where to put myself. Um, let's go ahead and uh, I want to rotate this so that it stands up straight. So in order to do that, I think I'm going to go ahead and use the, uh, the rotate function that I just clicked on. And it's asking me for the center of rotation. And I really want it right on this center point. So this is another case where I might actually use the perspective view to kind of um, get on that point. The midpoint would certainly work too. Um, so that's kind of an uh, approximation. I'm going to go with that because it's selecting. And uh, I want to make sure I'm at 90 degrees here and then just pull it, push it up um, to, uh, you know, 90 degrees. And now I have this uh, form uh, pretty much upright. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, now take this and I want to make a few copies of this thing. So um, I could certainly cut and paste it. Um, that's a completely legitimate thing to do in Rhino. Um, there is kind of a, a better way. Uh, you could try this copy function, which um, in which the with the copy function, you set a, a point to copy from. So I'm going to cop copy from this bottom point, And then you select a point to copy to. And you can copy multiple copies anywhere you want. Um, so it's actually pretty awesome um, if you like to work with, uh, you know, repetition or anything like that. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of zoom my views just a little bit so I know what I'm doing here. I'm actually going to um, put the perspective view kind of in the majority here. Um, and pan just so there we go. Okay, so I have uh, one thing right now I have in NURBS, and I'm going to go ahead and leave it in NURBS. This, um, I'm going to go ahead and convert to polygons. So um, I can do that by going up here to the Mesh menu, and I can say uh, it's the first option. It says from NURBS object. So um, right now I have the sort of window brought up where it says fewer polygons and more polygons. Um, I'm going to flip this window just a little bit and click the preview button. Um, and you can see that is a whole, that's a whole lot of polygons. Um, that is what I would consider a high resolution mesh. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK to that. Um, this one, I'm going to 
do the exact same thing. I'm going to uh, do mesh from nerves object and I'm going to put it in about like halfway down. Um, so that's a slightly lower polygon mesh. That's probably about somewhere in the middle. And then I'm going to do the same thing over here um, and lower it way down. So now what have I accomplished? Well, not, not a whole lot at this point. Um, I mean, I've got these copies that are polygons and that's great. Um, at this point, especially with the, um, with the lines being illustrated on the um, view, it's very difficult for me to visually tell a difference between how the surface is gonna be rendered. So I think what I should do in this case um, is change my view over to rendered. And um, you can start to see here the differences between the, the models. Um, I'm going to go ahead and kind of get in a little bit closer to the polygonal ones. So here you can see this is kind of our rough polygonal model. It is very, it's very clear that it is generalizing some of these forms and not representing it very well. Um, some people are fine with that. Um, the difference between the high and the medium is not that huge, right? Um, so the medium resolution one still looks pretty darn good. Um, I would guess that if you were to 3D print these, that you probably wouldn't notice much of a difference between the, um, between this one and this one. Um, I think people, when they make high resolution polygons, they have a tendency to go a little bit overboard. Um, however, I will say that if you were printing this medium one on a 3D printer, um, you might start to kind of notice some faceting here. Um, and so, it, you know, if you're especially concerned about the quality of the surface and that it be perfectly smooth, then make a very high resolution polygon model. Um, this one, you're definitely going to, you know, get some artifacts and get some uh, sort of clipping of the surface. Now, with this one, what would this one be good for? Um, probably the lower two would be really great for anything that you're doing real-time rendering with, um, because this one is so high resolution that it would potentially be cumbersome um, for, uh, you know, like a video card or a processor to kind of deal with uh, rendering all those polygons in real time. So if I were feeding something into some sort of game engine like Unity or something like that, I would certainly opt for the lower uh, resolution polygons. The other thing to keep in mind about polygons and you know when to select a low resolution polygon and when to select a high resolution polygon is that um, if the object is gonna be this bit, like if this is a vial of strength that somebody's gonna be carrying around, it absolutely does not matter if it's the low resolution polygon one because nobody's gonna be able to tell the difference. Um, if it's like a person high, you know, um, uh, chalice uh, or something, then um, yeah, you would definitely want to, you know, have it be, you know, uh, better represented. So it's a little bit like thinking about resolution with two dimensional images, like back when we were in Photoshop. Um, the more polygons you have in a in a file, the more uh, kind of space it's going to take up on your hard drive and the more intensive uh, it's going to be on your computer. So the, the nice thing about the, the NURBS model, and I guess I'm saying this like as a maker, is that the NURBS model can be sort of absolutely perfect at all times. Um, it's really like an abstraction. And so you can take this NURBS surface and you can make an infinitely high number of polygons if you wish. Um, so it's, it really is um, as close to perfect as you can get. Whereas the polygons are also always like an approximation of um, the abstraction. So it's kind of an interesting relationship um, that we have between you know, NURBS and polygons. Okay, so I hope that was uh, maybe clarified some things for you about NURBS and polygons. 
Now, uh, I think we're going to go ahead and spend uh, the rest of our time together today uh, looking at uh, a, really a construction project. So um, I think this construction project needs to happen uh, probably in, um, uh, let's see, this grid should be fine, I think. Um, so I think I'm going to start with some simple object projects. And uh, what usually happens is, you know, we have this impossible object project, and then we move on to uh, an environment design project where um, you, you know, start thinking about larger spaces that maybe might contain objects. So it's a way for us to kind of build you through um, the different um, kind of functionality uh, within Rhino. So we're going to start with objects. We've done a couple of very simple objects. We're going to make our objects just a tiny bit more complicated, um, and we're going to get deeper into the kind of functionality of Rhino. So I think I'm going to start off um, by making a table. And I know it's the most exciting thing you've ever heard. Um, well, the main reason I want to make a table is because I want a thing to hold my other things. So um, let's see. Well, we could certainly start um, in a kind of really basic way. Um, we could make a rectangle. And, you know, this technique of working 2D to 3D um, is kind of uh, probably the foundational way of working in Rhino. Um, you can certainly start with so solids. Um, there are plenty, I just clicked back a second. There are plenty of solids that you can just draw, um, excuse me, right in, right in this menu, right here. These are all solids that you can draw. Um, I think it's a lot easier in some ways to get what you want if you start with, uh, start with two-dimensional objects. Um, because these are always going to be sort of limited to their sort of simple shapes. Um, but as we build, you'll see we will we will use um, some of these functions um, to, you know, just make like simple additions to our objects. So they're all there for you to try out. Um, but like I said, I think we're going to just kind of go for the gold here and make our table exactly the way we want it. So um, first corner of, of the rectangle, well, I mean, zero, zero is a great place to start drawing stuff because then, you know, everything kind of works out mathematically. Um, other corner or length. Now, in this case, I think I'm actually not going to eyeball it. Um, I think I have a pretty good idea of how uh, long I want my table, which would be uh, 50 inches, let's say. And I can click enter there. And for width, I think I want it. Um, so right now I'm just kind of like eyeballing just to see what um, the Y value is right now. So two feet looks pretty darn good. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and say, let's go for 30 inches, which is, you know, just a little bit uh, longer than two feet. And it's asking me if I want to make it rounded. Um, there's an option for rounding the rectangle. Uh, I could, but I don't think I'm gonna do that. And so then I can just hit enter. Oh, sorry, I accidentally clicked rounded. So, meh, how about zero? <laughs> Since I decided I didn't wanna do it. Um, but as you can see, it is uh, definitely, it will make you a, a rounded rectangle. Um, okay, so let's see, that's great. And at this point, I could go ahead and, you know, extrude it and make a tabletop. I want to kind of hold off on that, though, for a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just draw some things out in 2D. So one thing that I'm pretty sure that I want my table to have is legs. That is a good thing for a table to have. So I could just kind of place the legs, you know, willy nilly wherever I want, uh, or uh, I could do it the so-called right way. <laughs> um, and uh, I, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna make a curve inside of the curve to use as a guideline for filling out the kind of like interior of the table. 
So I'm going to make an offset curve. And it asks me for a direction. And so in this case, I kind of want it to go inside, fully inside the table. And uh, it lets me define a distance from the table. So I can do, you know, five out or five in. Um, five actually seems like a totally reasonable distance for this. Um, and so I'll go ahead and just um, go with that. And in this case, um, you know, using sharp corners is actually useful for me because uh, I, what I'm looking for are these little these little points right here. So I, again, I don't want it outside. I want it inside. And now I have this um, sort of shape with sharp corners. So this is a case in which um, you're really not maybe drawing what you're making or drawing what you want to have on the screen. But in this case, we're drawing something to use as a guide. So now um, what I could do is I could take this circle and I'm going to draw, let's see, one circle here. And I'm going to make it like, uh, actually, you know, I'm not a fan of big chunky table legs. Oh, I'll talk to you later. Sorry, it's my phone. Um, I want my table legs to be kind of uh, elegant. So I'm going to make the thickest point, which is going to be the top. Um, I'm going to make that, uh, it looks like about two inches in uh, radius. Um, maybe even an inch and a half. Uh, so that's three inches in diameter. Okay, so now I have my circle set up there. Now, I could do a couple of different things. I could certainly transport the circle to these other points um, and copy it and work that way. Um, probably what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and design the whole table leg and then take the whole table leg and just copy it to these four points. So another thing that I'm going to create um, is something called like a, a skirt for the table. Um, I'm sure you've noticed a lot of tables are not just like, you know, four, like a top with four legs. They have like a little like rim around them. Um, so I'm going to take this curve and I'm actually going to offset it um, by a tiny bit. So I'll go ahead and offset this curve like not five inches, maybe like one inch would be plenty. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and do that on the outside, I think. Um, and so this is sort of the first place where we're going to start to see some dimension um, come into the table. So um, if I grab this curve and this curve, um, I, what I'm going to do eventually is I'm going to extrude them and then they'll make like a little rim. Okay. Um, with this sort of table leg shape, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw um, a kind of more uh, complex sort of uh, thing, and I'm going to use the revolve command. So what I could do right now, I might be making it a tiny bit unnecessarily complicated, but um, I'm going to go ahead and take these rectangle shapes and I'm going to move them onto a new layer. So what I did was um, I went over to the right uh, toolbar and you can see right now I'm working on the default layer and uh, I want to go ahead and move objects to this layer. So I'm moving them to layer one. And the reason I'm going to do that is because um, now if I deselect them, number one, you can see they're a different color, which is kind of nice, but I can also uh, make them go away. <laughs> um, and making things go away in Rhino is super, super useful because as you can see, um, if we don't make them go away, when we want to kind of work with this um, circle, it's going to kind of like snap all over the place and just be kind of a pain in the neck. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the front view where I can see the side of the circle. Um, 
I'm going to also um, just, I don't usually use point objects very often, but this is a really great case for it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put a point in the center of the circle to use as a guide. And uh, I'm going to kind of bring up the front viewport because I'm going to be working like in side to side. Um, now, again, um, you know, just because I'm being kind of fussy here, I'm going to kind of do things like the, the hard way. Um, so instead of drawing kind of a curved line and hoping that it's the right size, um, I'm going to just draw a regular line and I'm going to start it where I put that um, circle and I'm just going to come down. Oh, it looks like I'm not at 90 degrees, right? So this would be a good time to activate ortho mode. And I'm just going to kind of like, I can tell you that a good table height is like 39 inches, maybe. Um, so we could just um, go ahead and set that up for negative 39 um, because we're going under zero here. Excuse me, that's in the X. Oh, silly me. So let's see. So here's our Y and hmm, let's see. Basically we want three feet and three inches. So I'm actually just using the measurement on the bottom to kind of dial it in. And it's not, it doesn't really have to be precise either, but this is basically sort of the, the height that I'm going for. And so um, I'm just going to use this as a height reference. And you may have noticed that I made a small mistake here. Um, it looks like I uh, didn't have ortho enabled uh, when I started drawing this, and it kind of went ever so slightly off in that direction. So that's really easy to fix. Um, we can just take the curve point and we can kind of jog it back there. Um, and it should be, I might have to try it one more than once. Jeez. I'm actually going to just draw the line again. Um, so the problem was that when I started, I don't think I, yeah, I didn't have ortho enabled. And so now that I'm using ortho for the whole thing, um, it's not giving me a problem there. Um, it's good that I caught that error. That can be like a real annoying thing. Um, if you spend time drawing something and then you realize that it's not kind of planar or it's not lined up, it can be very frustrating um, and it can make things go wrong, uh, you know, pretty hugely. <laughs> so uh, it's one of the, maybe, uh, I think especially when you're learning, that can be one of the most frustrating things about Rhino. Okay, so this is all nice and straight now, and I'm basically uh, going to use this as just a, a little bit of a guide. So um, I don't really want these, um, you know, this table leg to be like super sharp. So I'm going to give it at least an inch on the bottom. Um, so that would be, since this is going to be multiplied by two, I want it to be, you know, at least half an inch or two, two small units um, in. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to create like kind of a really graceful looking curve here. So I'm going to just put one curve next to the center line. And then I'm going to put the other one out here. Now it looks like um, I also messed up a little bit on this. Um, and it looks like this will be fixable. So it looks like I, um, my first point was kind of like way out here on the origin. And so that's easy enough to fix. Um, you can actually, you know, just drag the point and move it. So at this point now, I just need to move it, um,
bother. How annoying. Um, so I think I'll start at the top. And the good thing about starting from the top, when you start and you say that you're starting in planar mode, this is like a good problem to be having, I guess, for everybody to know about this. It's going to snap to the origin. So when I started here, um, it's basically snapping to the to the origin rail, um, even though this uh, is not on the origin. So uh, all that to be said, if we start, um, if we start basically at the point where it intersects with the circle and then move here and then go down, um, you can see now it's perfectly lined up. So it's just one of those things. Um, I actually don't want to be in ortho mode right at this moment. But I am planar, and that's what matters. So that's what wasn't sort of taking first. All right. So, of course, you know the easy thing to do with all of this would be just to take this um, this circle and extrude it, right? I mean, that would be the simple way to do it. Um, so if you're thinking like, oh my God, does it have to be this hard? Um, no, not really. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, it'll be a nice result. So. Um, now, at this point, I basically just want to take this curve and, and rotate it um, and make a revolve. So I can do a surface revolve. And uh, the start of the revolve axis can just be this center point that we defined. And we can just snap that down there. Um, and we're going to go for a full circle. Now this tells me that my axes are a little bit off. So I'm gonna make sure that I click on this center line. Um, there we go. That is what I wanted. Okay, so now uh, one last thing, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and make this a solid. So uh, we can go ahead and just select the cap planar holes option here. And now that I have the leg pretty much done, um, I think it would be a great time to uh, bring back the rest of the table. So um, we did say uh, at some point uh, that a table has four legs. So I think we could go ahead and just um, put those into place. So um, I'm probably, I'm gonna look, oh, that looks nice and spindly and weird. Yay. Um, so uh, I could take this uh, object, uh, the poly surface, and I could go ahead and just kind of copy it into place. So I'm gonna copy it from the sort of center point that I defined at the top of it. That also does exactly cor you know, correspond to, the, um, to this part, these little corner points. So I just need to kind of copy it to the four corner points and then we're pretty much done with the table legs. Um, we also have uh, this thing that we can deal with, and uh, we could certainly take one at a time. Uh, we could take these one at a time and extrude them. Uh, the better option, however, is to extrude them both at the same time because it will it is smart enough to put a hole, a hole there. So um, here we can say solid uh, extrude planar curve straight. And uh, we want these to kind of like go underneath the top um, and to be maybe four or five inches. Um, so that's four, let's do five to just make it. Um, great. And so just to make things kind of easy on ourselves after those uh, maybe slightly difficult legs, um, let's go ahead and um, make, uh, let's just make a straight rectangular table. 
So again, I can extrude this um, straight. And in this case, I want to go up from the sort of apron of the table or the skirt. And I'm going to make it pretty like nice and like at least two inches thick. So it's like nice and substantial. Now you may notice that I've gone ahead and made the perimeter for the table, but I haven't made um, the top and the bottom. So um, that's actually the difference between going to surface extrude curve straight. It will just make the perimeter surface. And if you go to solid extrude planar curve, um, it should actually make the top and the bottom. But we can also just say here, cap planar holes, and it kind of splits the difference. So there, that's sort of same, same. Okay, so we're just about there. There's sort of like one little detail that I feel like we need to kind of address. Um, and that is that this rim is intersecting with these uh, table legs. So what are we going to do about that? Well, I guess the easy way to deal with it would be to just move the table legs. <laughs> um, we are going to deal with some ways of actually trim trimming things. So let me just kind of go over the different ways that we can deal with it. Okay, so this is the, probably the easy way. Um, and that would be just kind of, you know, moving the table leg like out a little bit so that it's not, you know, doesn't have the thing moving through it. That, that's definitely the easiest way. Um, if you wanted things to be exactly the way you wanted them, we could trim this bit off. Um, and that is uh, a function called the trim, trim function here. So um, basically you select the cutting object. And so the cutting object in this case would be the, the leg. Um, we may have to, yeah, select it from there. And then the object to trim is this thing. And so, yeah, that, that worked. I mean, there's still a line, sort of line there that we can get rid of. Um, but um, that's basically kind of the, the not as easy, but also pretty easy way of dealing with it. So uh, we could certainly trim all of those little uh, intersections. Um, now, you may be asking yourself, um, why, you know, we would or wouldn't want to do that. Or, um, I mean, there are other ways of doing it too that we could think about, but um, I think for now, we're just going to kind of call this done. Um, I'll trim it kind of on my own time um, because we don't have to do it more than once, um, but you would need to do it four times, obviously. So um, the next thing I think we want to think about is maybe to think about the idea of some sort of a uh, lamp. And then I think we're going to also make some sort of stool. So now notice, by the way, that we have sort of a full table going on here. Um, I'm going to zoom in extents for just a second here. Oh, I thought there was a little mark on it. Okay, so I can just do a select all at this point. And what I think I should probably do is to go ahead and go to maybe this other layer um, called layer two, and I'm gonna rename it table. And uh, what I'm also gonna do is while these objects are selected, I am going to move objects to this layer. And so what is going to happen is when we draw something else um, that maybe we want to place into a room or something like that, um, we're basically going to continue drawing on the origin. And so in order to do that successfully, we're going to just get rid of the table um, and pretend it's not there. And then when we bring it back, we can have it be fully present and we can move it wherever we want. Um, but it's kind of a way of, uh, you know, clearing the decks, so to speak, to uh, really emphasize the thing that we want to make next. So 
I'm going to stop there and we're going to uh, definitely uh, engage in some lamp making. We're going to do floor lamps. We're going to do chandeliers. We're going to do desk lamps, all the lamps. Um, they're just really fun objects. So uh, I'll see you again soon and have a great uh, week. <laughs>